I am so excited about Yurina. Um, uh, Yurina Yoshikawa grew up moving back and forth between Tokyo and California. Um, so is a, uh, a, a resident of both and the world and experienced everywhere, which is wonderful. Um, um, experienced living as a, um, both in Tokyo and in California. Um, so brings so much experience and um, knowledge and uh, culture um, and writing experience. Uh, she has a BA and philosophy from Barnard College and an MFA in creative writing from Columbia University. She also taught undergraduate writing there for a few years. Um, having also worked in publishing in New York, um, and finally moved to Nashville in 2017 with her husband, Jin Yoshikawa, who um, is another um, involved member with JAST. So we're grateful that it's a family affair. Um, but what's exciting, what um, Yurina is a writer, a um, reviewer, a teacher, a panelist. She's been a panelist with us. Um, but she is a creative writing instructor with The Porch here in Nashville. And um, fun fact, uh, she, um, you can definitely ask her and I want, I'm, I'm curious because I, I have my favorites, but uh, Yurina and her family went back to Tokyo for um, winter break this year and ate a lot of konbini foods. So um, Yurina, what is the one go-to um, that you grab from the konbini? So I also have a particular convenience store that I like and it's 7-Eleven. Um, and 7-Eleven Japan has this um, ice cream. It's a Monaka ice cream. And it's sort of like a, uh, it's, it's like an ice cream bar, but it is just, I think it's like the most perfect ice cream treat <laughs> that you can get anywhere. And so I ate a lot of that. <laughs> Especially so in the great. winter. So it's a good winter treat too. <laughs> it, yeah. Yeah. I eat ice cream all year long, but yeah. um, that one in particular, yes. Yeah, well, I love it. And so something I am um, I love that Yurina is doing is she hosts, if you're here in Nashville, an AAPI, um, uh, Ameri Asian American Pacific Islander Writers Group monthly at the porch. And so I'm going to drop in some uh, links as well, or Yurina can drop, uh, we can, I'll drop those in as well, of where you can find out about the porch. And if you want to uh, sign up and register for the free event, um, the free program, but um, they do ask for res reservation. And I'm going to drop in Yurina's um, website as well, just to learn a little bit more about her and to find her writing. She, it's, it's, it's a pleasure to see her writing in print in a few Nashville um, publications recently, but also online. Um, a couple um, Japan America Society of Tennessee events. We are excited that the She Believes um, soccer tournament is coming to Nashville at the Geodis Park and hosted by the U.S. Um, soccer Federation. But we are excited that the U.S. the lead. This is a, a doubleheader game. The four teams are U.S., Japan, Brazil, and Canada. And they're playing in three different cities. And we're excited that the the, the lead game um, is US versus Japan. So the Japan women's national team is playing the US women's national team here in Tennessee. And um, we have created a Japan fan section with some special tickets that we're promoting to our members and website. So I'll drop those into the website as well into the link where you, here's this one, you can purchase your tickets. If there is, um, if you have any issues with the link, please let me know. Um, Cause we can, um, I have a contact to add some more seats to that, but Japan cheer section for that game. Um, we also have coming up on March 15th, our uh, Tennessee Japan Forum um, and annual meeting, annual member meeting. It is a ticketed event, free for members, and there is a, a small fee for non-members, but we have a really exciting program. Um, there might be a couple of changes. We had a last minute cancellation, um, but um, you can learn more about that here. And we have our Mitsui Lecture Series, our third event. Our date is going to be March 20, uh, 22nd. And um, details on that will be announced shortly as we're finalizing them, but it will be an online event again. So um, Carol, hopefully you can join us for that, but it'll be an online event in the evening of March 20, uh, afternoon of March 22nd. Um, with all of that, I would like to now turn this back to um, Irina. Irina, take it away. Thank you so much, Madeline. And thank you, Jast, uh, for letting me do this. Um, this is our fourth installment of Reading Between the Lines, and I have enjoyed doing this so much every single time. And um, it's really given me a chance to, you know, I read Japanese literature for fun, also as a professional book reviewer. And sometimes I use parts of it to teach creative writing. Um, but 
I feel like doing these events makes me reevaluate these books kind of in a new light. And it makes me think about, um, you know, what are these translations really bringing to readers in America? So um, thank you. Thank you so much for this opportunity and this platform. Uh, just a quick note, uh, as you are aware, this is recording right now, and uh, it will be uploaded later on YouTube through the JAST account for those who were not able to make it tonight. And, um, and you know, I, I hope that for those of you who have come to my events before, you probably know that my uh, one hour of doing this, it's not meant to be like a lecture or a webinar. I don't want to just be talking at you. I am not a literature PhD or an expert on Japanese, you know, folk tales or yokai or whatever that we're going to discuss tonight. I am really an expert at like holding space uh, and moderating discussions. So I hope that we can keep this as kind of organic and interactive as you like it to be. And so I will, you know, share my screen. Uh, we will look at particular excerpts from the book. So even if you haven't read it beforehand, no worries. We can just kind of discuss what we see on the screen. And if you have any question or comment at any point, uh, please feel free to unmute and speak. Uh, while I'm sharing my screen, I might have a hard time seeing if your hand is up. So just unmute and speak if you like. Uh, I would love for you to, you know, uh, be part of this ongoing discussion this hour. So uh, without, you know, we we have a lot to get through, so I want to dive right in. Um, Where the Wild Ladies Are by Aoko Matsuda. So as uh, Madeline uh, said earlier, I did get to go to Japan to visit family. And one of the things I did other than eating convenience store foods was I visited a bookstore and I got the original Japanese edition of this book. And so I got to this time kind of compare both the translation and the original. So um, I think it'll be really fun for those of you in the room here tonight who might be studying Japanese language or culture, um, you know, there'll be some parts that might be of particular interest to you tonight. Uh, Where the Wild Ladies Are by Aoko Matsuda in Japanese is Obachan Tachi no Iru Tokoro. Now, um, a quick fun thing about this title, for those of you who, you know, grew up with picture books in America, or maybe you're a parent and you're reading a lot of picture books, this might sound a little familiar to you. And I want to bring up this book. This is our copy of Where the Wild Things Are by Maurice Sendak. This is a classic American children's book. So the title, even in the original Japanese, um, when this picture book is published in Japan, this is uh, Kaiju Tachi no Iru Tokoro. So this author, when writing in Japanese, she was making a direct reference to this book. And the book also makes an appearance in one of the stories. Uh, we will not look at that particular excerpt, but I just wanted to show you, um, you know, for, for those who are interested in the title. And I just wanted to, I think this would actually be a really good overview of the mood and the tone that Matsuda sets. But um, there's a really key point in the story where the monsters, you know, they have a rumpus together and the boy wants to leave this island of monsters and the monster, the wild things cried, oh, please don't go. We'll eat you up. We love you so. And that line, we'll eat you up. We love you so. That's a line that really stays with one of the characters in Matsuda's stories. And, you know, that combination of you love something so much, you want to kind of do violence to it. That passion, violence, that, um, that mixture, I feel like is something that the author Matsuda um, also was probably drawn to because it's kind of apparent in all of the stories. There's a lot of passion, there's a lot of rage, there's a lot of playfulness too. Um, and I think, yeah, it's, it's kind of when I realized that um, this book was being referenced, it was such a big light bulb moment. And I thought that would be a fun way to just show you what this book is kind of about, although it's about so many things. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen so we can talk a little bit about this author. Can everybody see okay? I'm sharing my screen now, and this is actually taken from the back of the book where we see the author and the translator biographies. Um, so Aoko Matsuda, 
Um, I won't read this exactly, but I just wanted to share sort of what she looks like and what the translator, Polly Barton. Um, this really feels, the English edition feels like a really collaborative uh, project. Um, when you read the original Japanese, um, you kind of see that the translator has translated not necessarily word for word, but for a lot of nuance. And um, I'll kind of show you what that means as we get into the text, but I think it's really great that we see both of their bios equally like this. Uh, Aoko Matsuda was born 1979 in Hyogo Prefecture. I'm also, this is from my own research, so this is not part of this exact bio, but I'm just gonna kind of talk through her background. Um, she was actually born as Nobuko, but she changed her pen name to Aoko when, um, this is kind of a funny wordplay actually, she uh, she's a fan of the idol uh, Matsuda Seiko, Seiko Matsuda. And when you look at the kanji characters for Aoko, one could read that as Seiko. And so she thought it would be kind of funny if people, this is like just like a little inside joke that she has with her readers. She thought it would be funny if anybody mistook her for the pop idol's name or mispronounced it that way. So that is why she chose the pen name Aoko Matsuda. Um, but before she was an author, she studied English literature in university. She joined a theater company called Europe Kikaku. Uh, she worked both in sound and as an actress. And you can kind of get that uh, dramatic feel, like she's really great with dialogue. And um, even in her profile picture here, I, I feel like you can sense her kind of, um, you know, artsy personality with that. Bob haircut, and I could see her being a great stage actress too. Um, she also worked at a bookstore and studied to become a translator. And there's a lot of references in these stories of American media, literature, books. So I think that also makes sense that she was exposed to a lot of that in her early days. Uh, she made her debut as a writer in 2013 with a book called Stackable, which was nominated for multiple prizes. And uh, Where the Wild Ladies Are came out in, um, I think parts of it came out in Japan in 2016. The book was translated into um, this English edition in 2020. And the following year in 2021, it, this book actually won the prestigious World Fantasy Literature Award. Uh, which this is an award that goes out to anyone in the world writing fantastical works. A uh, previous winner, fun fact, includes Japan's own Haruki Murakami for Kafka on the Shore. Um, and I, you know, this is kind of a big deal that a book like this would win this world award. Uh, so I think it got a lot of attention um, after that award was announced. Now, let's see, um, before we really get into the nitty gritty of the book, I wanna um, stop the screen for a second and say that uh, there's a lot to notice in these short stories. You might have recognized from the description of this event that uh, the book is made up of stories influenced by Japanese folk tales, particularly when it comes to yokai, which yokai could be described as um, sort of like the wild things, right? Like they're like kind of like mischievous, playful, sometimes a little scary creatures. Um, yure, uh, which can be roughly translated as ghosts. But as we'll see, these stories are not, It's it doesn't fall into the horror genre. Uh, a lot of these ghosts are very human-like and very playful. Um, these stories are also influenced by something called rakugo. And for those who are not, familiar, I just wanted to share my screen with, to this picture. Um, so rakugo is an art form. It's a verbal type of uh, storytelling um, tradition that has existed in Japan uh, since the 1780s, maybe even before that. Um, some people might even know this as karukuchi or otoshibanashi. And um, it's where one person, usually one man, sits with a kimono like that in the center of a stage and tells a story, something that happened to him or something that ha you know he heard. Um, usually it's fictionalized. Usually these dakugo have a lot of wordplay and there's a punchline and it's funny and um, sometimes really poignant. And um, 
there's a lot of Rakugo masters still working in Japan today, but uh, it was, you know, uh, said to be originated in the Edo period, popularized in the Meiji and Showa periods. So this is really a traditional art form. And um, so a lot of these stories take inf influences from some Rakugo stories. Um, there are other stories that are uh, inspired by, and I'm going to pull up, let's see, um, I'm going to pull up, I don't know if anybody has ever seen Kabuki, uh, but if you're ever, if you ever find yourself in Japan, um, I highly recommend this experience of seeing a Kabuki a performance on stage. It's very gaudy, very colorful. The kanji for Kabuki literally means to sing and dance. I kind of like to think of it as Japan's version of like opera. Like there's um, Japanese traditional music in the background. There's a lot of singing, dancing, a lot of effects. Some of the actors, they get pulled up and they, you know, with strings and they look like they're flying through the air. It's very um, just like uh, visually stunning. And um, the makeup is, as you can see, and um, really heavy and glamorous. And the actors have to have really good facial muscle skills to be able to perform kabuki. And uh, this is also something that originated around the Edo period in Kyoto and uh, still performed today. Uh, and, you know, uh, there's some stories that, um, just like with Rakugo, there are stories that have been told over and over by popularity. And a lot of these stories kind of take from that pile. Um, and what's so fascinating about this particular book where the wild ladies are, is that they are trying to retell these old stories in a new light. They're all set in contemporary Japan in various parts of Japan. Um, and it's trying to, and you will see this even from the very first story that we're gonna look at, but it's trying to kind of take back the, um, it's trying to twist the narrative, it's, it's adjusting you know, some of the punchlines or the stories so that uh, some, you know, she, she really makes them her own, but she's also, I think she does multiple things. She's uh, teaching a lot of the readers, even like what these original stories are, because I didn't know a lot of these stories until I read through this. And at the end, she has a whole summary of um, the origin stories about two paragraphs long each. So you kind of get to see um, what she was working off of. But Purina, um, yes, I was just curious if curious if the Japanese edition has the same explanation or if Japanese readers get any extra. No, that's a great question. And I was actually going to bring up this fact that um, it, in the Japanese version, it's only listed by title. And if it says Dakugo or, you know, it might say, um, where does it say that? It was towards the end. Um, it is really just like a list. Oh, there it is. Yeah. So it's one page and it's listed like this. So it's really up to the Japanese readers to then kind of look these up. But what's great about this English edition, and I'll show you, um, I can even share my screen, uh, but uh, um, they, the translator Polly Barton at the end from page 255 onwards has actually written out um, not just the title and what kind of art form, but the story itself. I believe this was all the translators doing. Um, and oh, okay. Yes. Um, but it seems like, um, so Polly Barton, the translator, has also published a wonderful essay on Lit Hub and um, where she talks about uh, this this collection of short stories that she translated. I'm going to put it in the chats right here, but the title is uh, On Aoko Matsuda's Deceptively Delightful Call for Systemic Change. Uh, this was an online article that Polly Barton published, and it, I, I got the sense that she and Aoko were, you know, they had, like, not just worked together on this book, but um, it seemed like she, you know, they they were kind of like, um, more collaborative for the English translation, which makes sense because Aoko herself is a translator. So that is my guess. But um, yes, the English edition, um, if you also compare to the original Japanese, the order of the stories is also a little bit different. 
So um, there's a story that I loved. We're not going to discuss it tonight for the sake of time, but it's from the perspective of a tree called Enoki. Um, in the English version, that is placed around the middle, but in the Japanese, it's placed all the way towards the end. Um, I feel like that is a very subtle difference that if you are taking it in as a whole, it doesn't really change the experience. But, um, you know, for people who are really particular about like comparing translations, um, that might be something you notice. Um, before we kind of dive into the first story, do, does anybody have any questions or comments about just given this overview of this book and author? And if you ever do throughout, even while we're looking at the text, feel free to unmute and speak. All right, uh, I'm gonna share my screen again. Make sure this is working right. Uh, okay, so here you can kind of see the contents. Um, and some of them are short stories. Some of them are a little bit lengthier. Uh, thing to note is that I think a lot of these can be taken as standalone stories meaning that if you just pick this up and read just Enoki from 157, page 157, I think you can still enjoy it. But um, there are some recurring characters. And I think as a reader, there is a kind of beginning, middle and end arc that happens. Um, but you know, if, if you have limited time and you're only able to read a few, I think that's also okay. Um, this is the kind of collection that allows for a hybrid kind of reading. Um, although, yeah, do read the whole thing if you do have the time, because it's great. <laughs> uh, I'm going to start with the first story, Smartening Up. And uh, before we start, I'm also going to ask, um, I'm going to stop sharing just for a second. Uh, Madeline has uh, generously offered to read some excerpts out loud uh, so that my throat doesn't get so sore and I'll say so that you're not hearing me the whole time. Can I get maybe one or two more volunteers if I'm just like, can you read out this paragraph for the group? If you're able to. Allison, wonderful. Okay, so I might call on you to alternate um, just, to, just to shake things up. I really appreciate that. Um, all right, where the wild ladies are smartening up. Um, what I'm going to do with this one is I'm, I'll, I'll start reading um, and kind of summarize and jump ahead. And um, after we sort of get to feel the story like you're coming to it for the first time, that's the point where I'll kind of pause and we can talk about the original story that this is based off of. This is a story based off of a kabuki called um, Musume Dojoji or in the English, it's the Maid of Dojo Temple. Smartening up. Okay, so this is the way it starts, very beginning. I am a beautiful woman. I am a beautiful, intelligent woman. I am a beautiful, intelligent, sexy woman. I am a beautiful, intelligent, sexy, caring woman. I am, okay, that's just the right side done. I'll start on the left now. From just beside my ear, the beautician's voice cut through the affirmations with which I was busy filling up every inch of my headspace. Um, so just to summarize a little bit so that I can skip ahead, she keeps saying these affirmations to herself in her head, and she is at a beautician's office getting her hair removed with this machine. Uh, it beeps, it's painful. And um, just a quick note here um, for context, um, it's, you know, I think she mentions this a little bit later in the story, but in, in America, it's more customary to, for women to shave their legs, not so much their arms. Um, in Japan, it seems like that, that's also, you know, you shave both your legs and arm hair. And in this case, um, the reason why this, you know, uh, narrator is going through all this trouble to remove her hair, uh, it has to do with her love life. And um, she has just been dumped by this guy who, uh, when she really like went through all the details of like what led up to the breakup, she realized I forgot to shave. And so she obsesses over her hair and removing it. Um, so that's kind of what you need to know for the beginning of the story. Um, after this procedure, she goes home. On the way, she goes to Dean and DeLuca and gets some deli items. Fun fact, there's still a Dean and DeLuca in Japan. 
It actually does. I heard it doesn't really exist here anymore. There was a huge one in New York when I used to live there and that's gone. Um, but yeah, lo and behold, it was still there in Tokyo. I, you know, saw a couple shops when I was traveling around the city. Um, and it's still kind of a status of if you live in Tokyo and you're kind of this working woman with some extra money, you can treat yourself to a Dean and DeLuca and it's really delicious and fancy. So you get a sense immediately, even from the first few pages of the kind of lifestyle she has, uh, the kind of obsessions she has about beauty and um, her worth very con well connected with appearance. And I wanna skip forward here to page nine when this is when we first see one of the wild ladies of this book. Um, and here it is translated as auntie because it is her actual aunt. Uh, so a thing to note for those who are learning Japanese is that the word obachan, which is you know used in this title, obachan is a term that can mean both auntie or aunt, or also a more generalized term for older ladies. Um, it's kind of affectionate. Sometimes it's a little derogatory <laughs> depending on the context. Like nobody really wants to be called an obachan if you're you know not exactly of that age for example, but um, you know, I, I think the translator did the best she could here in translating the title to Wild Ladies, just like the wild things are. But in this story, it is her actual aunt. So Obachan is translated as auntie. All right, so Obachan first appears. Um, let's see. Madeline, would you mind reading out loud? This is middle of page nine from auntie, what are you doing here? Oh, you're muted. I'm muted, of course I am. Uh, <laughs> Auntie, what are you doing here? Goodness gracious, what's happened to you? You look dreadful. Examining my face with narrowed eyes, my aunt kicked off her cheap outlet shop sandals so that they landed right on top of my Fabio Rusconi heels and Repetto Ballerino pumps, neatly arranged in the entrance. What a pokey little doorway you've got, she squawked before clumping through into my apartment. Thank you. We'll pause right there just for a second because I want to um, also uh, let you hear, you know, for those who might be, uh, you know, uh, learning Japanese, what this might sound like in the ja original Japanese, because uh, in the original version, this auntie um, clearly has a Kansai dialect uh, and it sounds kind of like this. Um, Nanya anta hidoi kao shite. So that's the part where she's saying like, goodness gracious, you look dreadful. And um, in the Japanese, the dialect is something that I think a lot of writers hold dear because, um, you know, there's just so much variety within the Japanese language. And here we get the sense that the obachan, the auntie, uh, she definitely has held on to her like regional voice. Um, and she's also very curt. And this in, in the Japanese, when she says, oh, what a pokey little doorway you've got, uh, the Japanese version is genkan sema. And it's very colloquial and really like, um, you get this immediate sense of their relationship and the kind of dynamic they have where, you know, maybe she's always had this habit of speaking down a little bit to her niece. And um, you also get the sense here in Polly Barton's translation, I think, where um, it's not exactly that dialect. It's, it would be impossible, I think, to, to translate a dialect, but um, it's, it, it is really interesting to compare. And you do get the sense, especially with this part about her cheap sandals falling onto her like expensive things. Um, they're both judging each other immediately. And there is this kind of tension, um, even from the first moment when she steps in. Uh, skipping forward a little bit here. Um, let's see, I sort of put a line um, on this paragraph where the aunt, she keeps going on and on saying like, you're just like your mother. She had that awful posture. She was born miserable, that one was. Um, I think in the English, it, this does carry with it a kind of um, like a, like a personality, like a, like a, almost like a rural voice, um, which I think is, you know, Again, translation by nuance. So um, let's see. So uh, 
you know, immediately this narrator has this ant barging into her apartment unannounced. And what they end up doing is they end up watching a movie with Michelle Williams. <laughs> uh, probably that's, that's a way of just signaling this contemporary time period. And there's also a little bit of humor about it, I think, because the auntie clearly has no idea what any of this is. Um, she doesn't know what Dean and DeLuca is and like, who's Michelle Williams? And like, what, what are you doing? So they're watching the movie, they're relaxing. And finally the aunt gets down to why she's there. So, oh, um, that, yeah. Sorry, Irina, that, um, that Michelle Williams scene that they talk about in that story is really famous as a portrayal of um, women's, non-sexualized women's nudity of like w women's body positivity. Um, oh, which movie so it is really it? Because it doesn't, it doesn't say the movie title here. Oh, I did a lot of research about it because I, I don't remember why I was writing about it. I did like an uh, essay about body positivity in this story <laughs> because I love this story so much. Yeah. Um, I looked up what movie it was. It took a while. There's like a whole clip about it on YouTube. Um, I'll look for it and I'll tell you in a second. Sorry for interrupting. I would love, no, no, no. I would love to know that. And I think that would be really good context too for those who want to dive a little further. Um, and uh, by the way, Allison, um, Allison Fincher here, I'm, I'm actually like an online fan of you and all of the book reviews you do. And you, you did write a book review in the Asian review of books. So hopefully the participants here can also read that. I really learned a lot from that too. But um, yeah, the Michelle Williams film, they comment on it. Oh, it's actually um, because of the facial hair. Yes. It's Take This Waltz. It's from Take 2011. Okay. Um, the New York Times noted uh, that the nudity here reminds us that young flesh will age, old flesh once young. Uh, old flesh was once young, time wins in the end. So it was like very famous at the moment that it debuted. <laughs> okay, that 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 is so great. And also I was kind of gonna skip forward, but I, I, I think it's worth maybe taking just a quick moment here to talk about the scene where the aunt and the narrator are watching this film. And um, maybe we can get, uh, Madeline, if you wouldn't mind reading again from, this is page 10 from the middle, um, without a moment's hesitation. Without a moment's hesitation, my aunt sat down at a perfectly laid dinner table. The elegant mini minimalist chair, which matched the table, groaned as it accommodated a body significantly heavier than, it, than of its usual sitter. I remained standing, staring incredulously at the finger-sized puncture that had appeared in the roast vegetable terrine. The film kept playing. The hair on Michelle Williams' arms shone beautifully in the sunlight, and I felt a wave of jealousy toward all the blonde women in the world who had never had to give de la, uh, de de depilation a thought. Heavens, and it skipping. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. And skipping forward a little bit, um, when they get to the part about the Michelle Williams' character let's um this is bottom of page 11 um would you mind reading again from my aunt stayed with me my aunt stayed with me for dinner and watched the film through to the end she didn't show much interest in the storyline her eyes her eyes roaming inquisitively around the room but uh during the scene where michelle williams's character and another woman showered in the nude her mouth fell open you know that's something i've always you know, that's something I've always thought was strange. The hair on foreign women's arm and legs is so pale you can barely see it, but their hair down there is as dark as ours. Right, I agreed. She did have a point. I once heard that the color of people's hair down there is the same as the color of their eyebrows, but that can't be true, can it? I suppose the place that needs the most protection, so the body puts all the power into making the hairs there as strong and dark as it can. Yeah, who knows? Come on, there's no use getting all embarrassed. I want to hear about your real opinions about your hair. Ignoring my aunt and the open palm she was striking on the table, I shoveled some Caesar salad into my mouth. So, you know, um, I, I really want to thank Allison for um, pointing this out because, you know, this is so obvious now, but reading it together with you all, I'm realizing this section actually has a lot of um, foreshadowing about what's about to come. So there's the talk about the facial hair, but in the aunt's description, um, she actually uses the word power. She says, you know, the body puts all its power 
into making the hair there as strong and dark as it can. And if you do have the book in front of you, I want you to underline that or highlight it because that's going to be a, a big hint to what's going to happen next. And this idea of hair as power, I think is, um, it's just, I, I didn't even realize it. <laughs> but uh, the author really plays with that so well, um, even in this kind of um, moment that seemed mundane at first glance. So thank you. Um, all right, so uh, this is when um, the aunt reveals why she's there in the, to begin with. And um, let's see, where is that line? Um, I think it is, yes, just on the next page, on page 13 at the top, she, she says, you know, um, what do you think you're up to? I know you've been deliberately weakening the power of your hair. Power of my hair? I was so concerned I came rushing straight over. And what do I find? Everything's all swish and swanky. It's horrible. And what's with all this pink rubbish you've got strewn around the place? And, you know, the berating continues. They glare at each other. And then they get into this heated argument. And at the bottom of page 13, the aunt says, your old aunt sees everything, you know, which is more than can be said of you. You didn't even notice he was two timing you all that time. What a sorry state of affairs. And the reader might be wondering, how does this aunt know everything? And it's by the end of this page, of page 14 at the bottom, when the narrator in this heated moment um, defends herself and she says, you're dead, right? You died a year ago, hanged yourself. And like, what are you doing here? And oh, the, this is the moment you, the reader and everybody realizes this aunt for this whole time has been a ghost. Um, and this is what I meant earlier when I said that uh, these stories, many of them feature ghosts, but it's not like a horror story that uh, just take this as a great example of like, if you were to meet this aunt anywhere else, you would just think she's any other auntie or obachan. Um, she doesn't, she's not described as like translucent or anything. She just really appears like anybody else. But um, the narrator seems also just kind of uh, matter of fact, right, about this, this condition. And there are times throughout the story when other characters will meet ghosts and then they'll have a moment of surprise or shock, but very quickly they, they accept that situation that they're talking with a ghost and then the story continues. And I think that's a really interesting way of doing ghost stories. Um, if you're looking to, you know, uh, just get into that kind of um, that mindset. Uh, I, I, I think it also has to do with the tradition of, you know, when um, when the Japanese think of, of spirits, for example, or ancestors, it's not really seen as spooky um, when someone might say like, oh, you're, you know, your ancestors are watching over you. Uh, there's the sense that they are there sort of floating around watching over you, but it's not it's not like a westernized kind of ghost. It's it's more like a gentle spirit. Here, I wouldn't say she's gentle, but I I think there is that sense of like friendliness and playfulness um, to this ghostly presence. So um, if if you are gonna read this whole book or maybe you have, uh, there is a mention of this aunt's son and the narrator's cousin, Shigeru. He will be a character later on. So this is a little nugget there to say like, watch out for his name later. Um, I want to, just for the sake of time, because there are a couple other stories I want to share with you, um, I want to skip forward to page 17. And this is when, at the bottom of page 17, the aunt, um, in conversation, brings up, hey, do you remember that kabuki we saw together all those years ago with your mom? And this is a little, I, I find it to be a little bit on the nose, but for some reason it worked for me <laughs> um, and to say like, this is what the story is based on. And you can even read about it at the end, but um, I wanted to share my screen now to, um, here's a drawing, if you can see. Okay, so the Maid of Dojo Temple, just to really like quickly summarize it, um, this, this kabuki, the story is about a, a young woman named Kiyohime 
who fell in love with this handsome priest, but uh, you know the priest would reject her so many times and so much that Kiyohime, her passion and love morphed into a powerful hatred and she transformed into a fierce fire breathing serpent. Uh, and the serpent wrapped itself around the bell of the temple and breathed a stream of fire and um, until the bell melted and the priest burned to death. So uh, that's what happens in the Kabuki. This is a drawing rendition of that. But I want to show you what, um, if you watch the actual Kabuki on stage, when the when Kiyohime, um, just a side note, Kabuki is performed by an all male cast historically, traditionally. So you know this is um, Kiyohime being played by a male actor, and this is the point where Kiyohime has transformed into a snake. And this is uh, one rendition of a costume, but it's exactly as it's described in Aoko Matsuda's story. Uh, the actor, actor Kimono is sparkling silver and those uh, triangles that you see are meant to represent the snake scales. And she's on top of that bell uh, being a formidable kind of presence. And there are some productions that where um, this, um, the Kiyohime at this point actually uh, is performed by two actors um, as though it's like like a two-headed snake or like a like a giant creature that can you know only be represented by like more bodies so uh, that is something that is also referenced in the story I want to go back to the text so that you can see how this manifests um, hey do you remember that time we saw the kabuki and so she describes the story she describes the performance that they saw together and then the narrator, uh, this is at the bottom of page 19, says Kiyohime was extraordinary. Her dance was a delicate lady like a fair. And then she grew more powerful. Um, I'm gonna skip forward a little bit. Her kimono sparked, this is page 20. And um, after they discuss this kabuki, the auntie, she says, you know, I'm trying to develop the special trick from being, from having these supernatural ghost powers. And she wants to kind of be like Kiyohime. She wants to harness this power to do something powerful. And, um, you know, she doesn't know exactly what it is yet, but this is at the bottom of page 23. She says to her niece, let's become monsters together. Okay, so I think the word monsters, this is a great moment where you can tell that the author Matsuda is trying to, um, reframe our understanding of the word monsters and here you know as a reader you you almost root for them to become these monsters these glamorous intense passionate monsters and um if you read the rest of the story you will see exactly how the hair and the power and the monster like all of that comes together and instead of it i think in the original kabuki um it is seen as just this horrific event that she turns into this this snake but in this story in smartening up even in the title smartening up right like it's almost as though that's a level up from where she started where she's telling herself these affirmations and getting her hair removed uh, by the end of the story she smartens up and becomes this monster proudly just like her aunt and that really sets this tone for the rest of this collection for how we think about monsters, how we think about women. And um, one of the things that, um, you know, the translator Polly Barton writes about in that Lit Hub piece that I shared with you all in the chats is that a lot of the times when uh, in, in the Japanese folk tales, when the ghosts are portrayed by, as, as women, you know, that, that sends a message, right? Um, if you think about it, just um, the, the women's passion equaling something terrifying, like Aoko Matsuda is saying, no, it doesn't have to be terrifying. We can take that back and say, this monstrous passion is actually something good, um, something to be harnessed and something that contemporary women need to maybe learn from um, and think about differently. So um, I know we have such limited time left and I always spend too much time on the first story. This is, this is my classic mistake. I'm like 
too ambitious. I was going to go over like four stories. I think we're just going to get through one more. <laughs> but um, before I move on to the next one, does anybody have any thoughts or questions about what we just looked at? Just so y'all know, that one is available for free on Granta. So if you didn't get a chance to read it and you're inspired, that one's accessible easily. Thank you, Allison. Yes. And Granta is a great literary journal. So it says a lot that I think her story was published there first. Um, other thoughts or questions about smartening up? Um, I want to maybe move on to another story. Let's see. I'm, so I'm going to try to think, which one should I do? Um, you know what we're going to do? We're going to do a fox's life because I really like that one. Um, and before I, let's see, I'm going to share. <laughs> so a fox's life, uh, this is this is a story in this collection um, that's based off of a rakugo called Tenjin Yama or Mount Tenjin. And uh, this rakugo was based on a centuries old legend about a human shifting fox. And uh, this is, I'm sharing with you a screenshot from a Ghibli movie called Pompoko, which really is about raccoons transforming into humans, but they also encounter foxes turning into humans. Um, for me, as a child growing up in Tokyo, that was kind of my introduction of this legend of like foxes being able to shapeshift into humans. And um, a lot of the times when they, this is like mid transformation, but when the fox turns into a human, his eyes are still very fox-like, they're very slanted like this. That's a very, you know, um, typical portrayal of these shape-shifting foxes. So uh, I'm gonna share, let's see. I, I also wanted to talk about Quite a Catch, which is another one of my favorites, but there's just, I, I could talk for like an hour on that one. So um, if, if you do end up reading this book, do do take notice of Quite, quite a Catch, because that one's a really good one. But um, in the remaining time, I want to take a look at a few parts from a fox's life, because I think it, it, it does have a lot of great nuggets to offer for us here. And um, you can even see in the opening, um, e each story is, you know, focused on a totally different character. Sometimes it's in first person, sometimes it's in third person or an om omniscient narrator. This time, it's um, unlike the first story that we looked at, this is third person. So Kuzuha is our protagonist here. Um, and you know, she's the story starts with somebody likening her to a fox. Uh, but she kind of understands that that is not meant to be a compliment. Um, it's not like foxy, like sexy. It's more like she really just looks like a fox. And she describes her life story uh, in the beginning as, you know, she was always a good student and she was able to take shortcuts and math problems. And, but she recognized, this is page 133, that um, standing out was not a way for a girl to be. And um, people resented girls and women who stood out. So she, by sensing that from, her surroundings, she chooses deliberately to hide a lot of herself. And instead of excelling in academics or her career, she ends up kind of leading, you know, a more, um, you know, just, just like a, a, a more subtle version of what she could have accomplished. And the whole story, it's interesting because it really goes through decades of her life in just a few paragraphs. And what we start with, with this fox woman, uh, she really comes into herself much, much later in life. So, um, which, which I find just really lovely because I think a lot of these, um, a lot of stories these days I feel like are about like younger coming of age stories or um, protagonists in their twenties or thirties. And it's really nice to see a story highlighting um somebody who kind of lived like a full life and raised a family and did everything quote unquote kind of like correct but she still feels like there's something a little bit off um and she can't pinpoint what that is and so um after her son graduates from college i think this is let's see oh she ends up marrying somebody very nice 
And there's a line on page 139, I believe, or 140. Um, I underlined this here. Throughout her life, Kuzu had, had always had the feeling that she was just pretending to be a regular woman. Um, and I think that's one of those lines that this is a fantastical book, but that, that feels like a very real statement. Um, next page on 141. In her 50s, Kuzu had developed a passion for mountain climbing. And this is when things really kick off for her and her life. And um, there is a part where, you know, she realizes she, she's really good at it. Um, and she, she really enjoys hiking and climbing mountains. And there's a moment where she almost falls off and she thinks she's going to die. And she says to herself, it was the good life I had. She screwed her eyes shut. She's like ready, like she did everything right in her life. And, and this is the moment when her body curls into a perfect ball. This is page 143 and executed 15 perfect 360 degree rotations landing at the bottom of the cliff on all fours. Well, Kuzuha looked down at her slender front legs covered in white fur. Swiveling her head back, she saw a body also covered in white fur, complete with a fuzzy tail. When she squinted, she could see a damp little nose just under her eyes twitching. So I really was a fox all along. Suddenly, a lot of things made sense to Kuzuha. No wonder she'd been so good at being a Japanese woman. Oh, I love that because she she specifies being Japanese, not just a woman. Like I don't know, there there I, there's a there's a statement there. That's that's a sneaky little you know, social commentary there, right? Um, and um, another part that I wanted to share from this story comes at the end. This is post, you know, realizing that she's a fox and she um, notices that at the company she works for, this is actually, um, she meets this young man um, who, this is Shigeru from the very first story. This is the very sad, um, you know, man whose mother, uh died and is now a ghost as we know as the readers but he doesn't know that and he's he's super depressed and in grief and he just you know um is carrying around this dark cloud and kuzuha you know knowing what she is um being a fox woman um she comes to this really interesting um statement here at the bottom of 140 Six. Um, Allison, would you mind uh, reading out loud from Society Had Changed? Not at all. Society, oh, sorry, I was looking at the underline. Society had changed a great deal since Kazuha's time working in an office. She'd heard now that it was hard even for men to become fully fledged employees with permanent contracts. Society had become more equal, but in a bad way. Women hadn't risen up, rather the men had slid down. Kazu had knew that this glass ceiling, which had previously been apparent only to women, was now visible to this young man too. I bet that comes as a, as a surprise to you, doesn't it? Kazuha wanted to say to him, it's different from how you were told it would be, right? You know what though? As women, we've grown up with that ceiling since we were tiny. There was never a time when we couldn't see it, but somehow or other, we've all managed to live with it. It'll work out in the end for you too. We can pause so, there. Thank you so much for reading. Um, so, you know, this is kind of how the, that the story ends um, just shortly after that moment. But I found it interesting that she comes to this kind of understanding after, after realizing she's been a fox all along. And, um, this also reminded me, you know, for those who have been involved with JAST and, you know, in Nashville, when we did the Women's Leadership Forum, uh, we ended up talking a lot, I think, about like what equality means for women. And um, I think feminism as a word still doesn't resonate in the same way in Japan um, as it does in America, where, you know, there's just been decades of, of movements and texts and scholars and um, in Japan, it's been, I think it exists in a very different kind of way. It's, it's, it's just like with a translation, right? Like it's not word for word, it's by nuance. So what does feminism, if, you know, what would feminism look like in Japan um, if it's not exactly the way we see it in America? Well, I think if you read 
where the wild ladies are, you get a really good sense of that um, and a good sense of how women are quietly um, harboring a lot of these like resentments and um, realizations and um, are trying to do something about it. And literature as a great way of communicating a lot of these like the undercurrents, right, of what uh, we're feeling in the world. I think this this book would be a really great sort of glimpse into um, into those social discussions. Um, and I hope even for those who have never stepped foot in Japan, um, or you know maybe you're still getting to know Japan through through literature like this, that uh, that you not only take away the the fun tidbits about rakugo and kabuki and yokai and whatnot but that you also come away with this uh really interesting and deep understanding of of what might be going on in the minds of these contemporary japanese women so i know we're out of time <laughs> i wanted to open it up to you know uh, general questions we have a couple minutes um does anybody have i'm going to stop sharing my screen here i'm sorry we couldn't get through more than two i i had such a big plan and you know it's just babbled on too much, but um, I hope you enjoy that. Does anybody have any burning thought or question or comment that you wanted to share? Yes, and feel free to unmute yourself. For those who didn't read this beforehand, did it make you want to read it? Hopefully. I have to say, I have been, I told you, Rena, as we started, I've been carrying it around for two months at this point. And uh, I loved, I read the first story. So I'm glad that we talked about that. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, that section that I read kind of gave me the, <gasps> this is a jest, we're a business organization, is this a topic? <laughs> so, but the way that you speak about it and reading it again right now really made me realize it's more, it's more than that. So, um, you know, it's, and it, it's not graphic, um, you know, so that's why I was like, I think we're good. Um, really <laughs> I'm sorry. I should have thought of that before. <laughs> no, it's fine. But, it, but, but you know, it really begs that question as well. Like these are conversations also to have, but it is, it's great literature and, you know, you're, it's interesting to learn. Like I love learning about the, you know, the voices in Japanese versus the voices in English. And in English, you you get that sense of that first story that the aunt is this brazen, loud, you know, character. And I can see so my family members in that, you know, we're we're Polish and we're, you know, um, you know, working class, and you know, they're they're loud and you know, they 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 would stick their finger in food and taste it, you know, without, you know, mess make sure that things are they're not the ones that everything is tidy. Um so it's so it's interesting how like the the translation I think does come across. Um and so yeah, so I appreciate. It. So it's it's I'm still gonna carry it around with me. And I do like they are that they are bite-sized stories. Um and yeah. so it it took me a minute until you pointed out in the end the stories that they're um uh you know that they're connected to. So it was great to have that reference. And so um interesting in the Japanese version, it's just the list of what they're referenced. But in the English version, I really enjoy that it has a description of those original stories. So um, I like having that um, connection too. So thank you. Great, 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 great book though. Like I have, I have a collecting piles of of books, but <laughs> it's been good. So thank you, Yurina. Okay, Madeline, so some of the stories are a little bit creepier. <laughs> just FYI. Yeah. <laughs> say I did read the whole book and I read it in about two and a half days you know on and off and it really drew me in but your explanation makes it richer and so it's too bad we can't listen to the other two that you did because I think I would walk away with a greater understanding and also Allison I wanted to thank you for what you said about the movie um, that was good too so I appreciate that's why I guess why you do these things in, in a club or readings because you can learn from each other so thank you both absolutely absolutely and thank you so much carol for um zooming in um from outside of nashville i really like yeah i i'm a fan of zoom for that reason for for the record the other ones that yeah that i plan to discuss were quite a catch and what she can do um what she can do is based on a folk buddhist legend of the kosodate yure or that's the babysitting ghost and it's a little creepy, but also really just like um, 
heartwarming and especially as a parent I came away thinking like oh if only I had a ghost to watch over my children sometimes um but if, if you are curious about you know um other aspects or if you have questions about um this book or you know things that you wanted to discuss uh you know I'm I'm available you can find me online so we can keep the discussion going beyond this but um, thank you all we might need to make this a uh, a uh, an hour and a half next time. Ah, um, uh, yes. You know, maybe. I remember that we were we were cut short last time as well. Um, uh, a couple things. So just, I, and I'm just curious. Um, we're gonna drop a couple things in the. I'm gonna drop in here as well. So Yurina's website and her AAPI writers group, um, and uh, as well, I'm. I'd love to know as well, curiously, which your favorite stories were, other people's as they were reading. So Carol. Um, you know, and uh, Allison, it sounds like you read as well. But um, the other thing as well, I just want to say again, Yurina, thank you so much. You know, round of applause um, reaction up there. But we, I truly enjoy like um, events like this, especially because we can share it online and um, can can get out to more people. It's you know, um, uh, regardless of where we are, we can all join and enjoy the stories. And um, I'm going to call out our staff member Raina Lyons, who has challenged herself to read the English and the Japanese version. So um, our staff might continue the conversation as well um and so uh for just as well we're curious you know we love to know more about um and Allison, thanks for those links. Um, we always love to know more about, um, you know, what can we do better? What did you enjoy about this program? So Ginger has dropped in a link for a survey. So um, other suggestions as well. There's a, a comment section in there if you have books that you'd like to talk about or other ideas. But um, I'm going to type in the suggestion that, Irina, we need this to be an hour and a half um, so that we can get through uh, more stories and have deeper conversations. Um, um, rather than but you've enticed us in, which is great. Uh, <laughs> so with all of that, on behalf of Jast, thank you guys so much for joining. We do have a couple of great programs coming up that you can find on our website, um, uh, jastn.org. And of course, um, the one I can't forget, we're excited about our Cherry Blossom Festival, the Nashville Cherry Blossom Festival. Um, we had a great uh, planning meeting about it. Ginger Burns, who's on the call as well, um, does a great job of uh, uh, putting all of our, our festivals and programs together. And so that's on April 15th, so save the date. Um, but we will see you at an upcoming event. And um, thank you all so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah.